I get into uh, when did I really realize I wanted to be a farmer? It's probably at uh, 2 30, 3 o'clock in the morning. And throw into this mix that I have a polka band. Hey guys, it's Sarah Hand here. I am in Middle River at the Erickson Family Farms. Established in 1889, this story holds near and dear to my heart because it is my family and we are going to talk about suitcase farming. If you don't know what that is, watch the story because you will find out it is very unique. It's how they make their farming operations very successful. And the cool thing is, is I'm part of that fifth generation. So the farm has been in the family for 133 years and I'm so excited to share the story with you. I'm Patrick Erickson and I'm a suitcase farmer. Hi, I'm Andy Erickson and I'm a suitcase farmer. I'm Tim Erickson and I'm a suitcase farmer. Hi, I'm Kathy Erickson and I'm a farmer, a farmer's daughter, I'm a musician, I'm a housewife, I'm a cook, I'm a lots of things, a jack of all trades. The Ericksons have been farming since 1889. Henrik and Kirsten Erickson were born in Sweden and they came to America when Henrik was 30 and Kirsten was 27. You know, that's kind of a magic number. Virgil and I got married, Virgil was 30 and I was 18. Like I said, I grew up on a dairy farm in uh, Becker County, uh, Minnesota, and um, I liked to dance. And so I graduated from high school in 1960 and that summer, my girlfriends and I would get together and go to the Rancho Ballroom in Wabin, outside of Wabin and go dancing. And this July 30th, we happened to be at a dance at the Rancho Ballroom and uh, this gentleman asked me to dance and we had enjoyed a good waltz. And, and as he was walking away to leave, he turned around and I give him a smile and it must have done the trick because then he asked me to dance again and wanted to take me home, but I had driven so I couldn't do that. So we had a dance that invited me or asked me out for the following Wednesday which was Whoopi John was a polka band gonna be at the Rancho Ballroom and that was our first date. He, he asked me out again and well anyway, we went canoeing on Labor Day weekend at White Earth. He proposed that day and I, we had only met a month earlier. I told him, I said, no, I said, I have to, I have to think it over for a month. <laughs> I packed lunch that day and I had homemade bread sandwiches in that lunch and I think that was part of the deal too because he said, oh, here's somebody who can bake bread. So, and I've been baking bread ever since my whole life. But anyway, the, we did get married that December 31st. So we knew each other from, you know, less than six months. Virgil's dad took over the farm operation in 1928 when he and Olga, who came from the Stephen community, got married. Virgil was the second oldest of four children. And when he got old enough to help out, he became a very important uh, aspect of the farm because his dad had arthritis and was not well in his later years, and so he took over being in charge of farming and has passed on that interest to farming to our family. From what I understand, the farming was really hard in Sweden because there was a lot of rocks. They didn't get away from the rocks when they came here to East Valley Township because our family has picked a lot of rocks. There were other issues, government issues or back farms, so they packed up their, their family. They had two children, Hilmer and Per, P-E-R, and they were very small because they were married only five years when they came over here. So they had determination to farm. We started our family. Sheila was born in 61. We brought her home to the Erickson homestead. The following year, then Virgil got a job at the Fish and Wildlife Service at Agassiz Refuge, and we had a chance to move out to the headquarters. He always came back to the farm after work every evening. So he was kind of like a suitcase farmer. He was lived, he lived off the farm, but he always came back and farmed. So what do you think? Pretty good? Yeah, it looks really good. You put your name on it? So all of us but one brother uh, left 
to go pursue a different career somewhere else. Sheila left and got married at 17, so she followed in my footsteps, got married young. Tim decided to go into the Air Force, so he left. So then Paul was the oldest next, so he was involved with farming more and decided that he wanted, he was interested in farming. So he kind of bought some land and together Virgil and Paul and and then Paul got married and, and then his wife and myself, we all worked together and became partners in farming. Pat went on to school a couple years of college and ended up getting a job away from home. Mary Jo went on a couple year a year of college and got a job. It was Paul that stayed home and he was farming. He was our partnership. Unfortunately, he developed scleroderma and passed away. So we were farmed a little bit by ourselves, but with the help of the older boys who came home on weekends, packed their suitcase and came home on weekends, we were able to you know, get our crops off and get them seeded. And then the boys got together and decided maybe we should form a partnership with the, the boys that had jobs off, off the farm. And so we formed Erickson Family Farms partnership. That has been working out very well for the last few years. What is a suitcase farmer? Well, it's interesting because when I lived at home, I uh, you know, lived up in the old house and we farmed from home. Uh, started after I moved away, then I would come back on weekends and help farm. And now I come back and, and farm a lot on weekends. And I always have a suitcase, right? Because I live 120 miles away uh, from the farm. So anytime you come up to fix something, it's a couple hour drive, but it's really, it's always in a suitcase. And I think about that, it's no different than traveling for work. You're, you grab a suitcase, well, here I come to the farm and work. So being a suitcase farmer and living out of state, I live down in Arkansas, farm up in Northern Minnesota. The farming starts early in the spring. It's different. You can't talk to local farmers there about the farming because it's just a different type of farming. But being a suitcase farmer, you know, you're always watching all the other neighbors earlier than they can up here. Um, you still look at the farmers down there, see what kind of tractors they drive, what kind of implements they're pulling. You know, you look at how they farm their land to see would any of that work up here? Would it help us out up here? You still watch the markets, you always get yourself looking at the weather. I hear that from my wife. Why do you always look, worry about the weather? It's like Mother Nature dictates what you can do and when you can do it. You know, the suitcase farming side of it, it gets to be kind of interesting at times. The spring isn't too bad. You know, you, there's only a couple main jobs that, that are required. So us being remote and coming up on weekends to make it work, it does work. It's really in the fall is really when we get into a pinch for, for help because by the time you need somebody to run the combine, the cart, the semi, uh, the fall tillage, if there's any ditching that needs to be done. All of that needs to happen in really just a, sh a small little window. So I think that's really where the, the family aspect of it comes into really handy because as people come up for deer hunting or just want to come up for the weekend, get away, the, even just one extra hand can make the world a difference to streamline the operation. Well, I think, you know, when I look at the farmers that, are, that were farming together with my uh, two brothers and, and grandma still farms, uh, everybody brings something unique. I mean, I look at it, uh, my Andy, he does all the financial side of it and he does very good at that in the marketing. I look at my brother, Tim, if we need parts, tires, anything remote, he's able to find it quickly, which helps us if we break down. Uh, he brings the expertise on working on different parts of equipment as well when he comes up here, right? And I think of grandma, you know, she does, she just pulls it all together. I mean, I look at it from uh, running for parts, hopping in a combine, a tractor, if we need somebody to take over for a little bit. I mean, she's fully capable. She's ran this tractor probably more hours than I have. So one thing about when you're out in the field and you have somebody like me, I'm the delivery person. I got to bring lunch that grandma made for Pat and Tim. She even put smiley faces on. What a cute little grandma, but now it's delivery time, so they got to eat. with a smile. Thank you. That was grandma. <laughs> oh, thank you, grandma. It's, it's really, everybody pulls that little piece together. We all can do most everything, but it's the teamwork side of it that really uh, 
makes me believe that this legacy will cont continue on as we're trying to instill that in the uh, nieces, nephews, and kids and such. So I think one thing that, that's really been the glue on the suitcase farming aspect of between my three brothers, the other brothers, and, uh, and mom is we're always in constant communication with each other. You know, we, we text each other every day, probably call each other, if not every day, every other day. And I think that kind of keeps the, the trust going amongst the, the folks that are in the operational side. So if we need some parts, we, what's our plan for marketing grain? Hey, what, what's the crop intentions for next year? You know, we, we're kind of all in the know of what's going on. That's the, the foundation of why it's been able to work. We do listen to each other. We may not like it sometimes, but we do listen to each other and, and hear what the other one has to offer to, uh, to make the job easier. All the kids learned to, to drive the tractor by the little Ford tractor we had. And they all learned to mow hay and rake hay and uh, pick rocks. Oh, pick rocks, it was kind of a thing too. So they all took their turns in pitching in and uh, it instilled in them hard work and yet the love of farming. Being the oldest son, it's, uh, I worked with my dad a lot on repairing machinery, you know, keeping it up, running equipment, you know, just building things. You, know, you, you, you have breakdowns, all farms have breakdowns. When Virgil got out of high school, he worked for his uncle Hilmer in Holt. They had a blacksmith shop and he learned how to fix plow lays and stuff. And, and when he graduated from high school, he took a welding class also. And so he has instilled in his kids the fact that you can repair things uh, that, you know, you can't just always buy new, you gotta fix what you have. So he has, his theory has been a lot of fixing, you know, we haven't seen a lot of brand new things ever come through the yard. It was always kind of a joke at our house because I, I in, our, in our house, and we didn't have a lot of kitchen cupboards and it was always kind of a joke. I wonder what color the kitchen cupboards are gonna be when the tractor comes through, they, uh, an older but new to us tractor or something. The things that happen on the farm, yeah. Well, when you have girls that like to run the tractor, you got little toilet paper. Yeah, so a long-lasting farm memory. Hauling grain, headed back to the field, the combine's full, parked by the trees, and here I come. I pass the corner turnoff, and I'm going to use the turnoff that's up by the woods. I get up there, I make my turn, and I missed it. The front of the truck goes down and all I see is grass up and around the windshields and I'm like, crap. How am I gonna explain this one? Can't call Andy, can't call Pat, but they're gonna find out. <laughs> so, put it reverse, it wouldn't back out of the ditch. I uh, have to leave it till morning. And as we're packing up for the night, yeah, I gotta make that phone call because Pat's on his way to the farm and he always drives past the field just to see how things are going and he's gonna see the back of the truck sticking way up in the air out of the ditch. That's one everybody reminds you of every year. I I'm, I'm happen to be sitting on today the first tractor I ever drove, the old 8N Ford. Uh, it, it, it brings back a lot of memories because I was four years old and I started to rake hay. It was the summer, so I was probably four and a half. And I was uh, pulling a dump rake and grandma over at the home place, they were uh, picking choke cherries. So what does a four year old do? You rake hay, you watch them pick uh, choke cherries and you take the rake and you run it into a fence and you total it out at four years old. Man, I bet you I was probably three or so. And uh, so we used to have an old pig barn just right across from the house. And uh, of course we had ducks and chickens and pigs uh, in, in the barn. And the geese would be on the west side of the barn. They'd, you know, we'd feed them out, out front. And uh, of course, you know, me being a little kid, walked over there minding my own business, not knowing what really was gonna happen. And all of a sudden the, the mother goose come chasing after me. But what the funny story is, is, uh, you know, mom would say she was watching me, right? But, you know, the picture will do a, a thousand words of, you know, how fast or how close she really was. But apparently she had a time to pick up the camera and take a picture of me getting almost attacked by this goose. And uh, the legend continues. And throw into this mix that I have a polka band. And I've, you know, been in the band business for 45 years. You know, I never let the band take over from helping out on the farm. I just, we kind of made it work together. 
the one part I remember with the music is it always brought out the best in people. You know, the festivities, the dancing, the visiting. It's the community coming together. And, and it's something I really, really cherish. When Mary Jo started first grade, or kindergarten, first grade, I decided to go back to college. And so Thief River Falls has a, has a two-year college, and I enrolled. And it was also the, one of the first years that I was playing in the band. So every, all, all the money that I made playing in the band, I put towards tuition for college. So actually, I played my way through school. I paid for all my tuition. And I took uh, two years of all their music classes and journalism classes, plus all the regular that I had to take. The college also had a radio station. Later on, they were running into financial trouble, or fin and, and so they decided the only way they could keep that radio station alive was to incorporate a polka show. And that's how that started. And Ron and Elsie Sherrick started the polka show, but sometimes they couldn't make it and they needed a substitute. So they called and asked me if I would fill in. Well, I did, but I really didn't know much about the radio station, so I enrolled in the broadcasting classes at Northland College and so that one winter I <clears throat> went every day to, to the classes and part of the you know you had to be on air so I chose the six o'clock in the morning shift because the young kids didn't want to get up that early so so my training was at six from six to eight in the mornings at Northland I went to the manager of the radio station and I said, well, could I get my own radio show here? You know, <clears throat> because I knew of a station in, in another state that had a variety show and it was pretty successful. So that's what started Kathy's Variety Show and I've been, this, that started in 2007, so I've been 15 years doing Kathy's Variety Show. Uh, about five years ago, I was able to get a grant to get the studio here in the farm, at the farm in our office area. Such a nice mulse that I think we have to have one more nice mulse. Here is a Yankovic medley done by the Del Sinchek Band from Cleveland, Ohio. 13 hours a week of volunteer radio show on weekends. I have grandkids that listen and they send me a text message and say, good morning, Grandma, I'm listening. I'm known as Grandma Polka to a lot of the grandkids and the great grandkids. And so they, they listen to the radio and dance around in their homes. And I, I think that's pretty cool. For me and my other job, I, I travel a lot for aviation. And uh, there's an app on my phone, it's Radio Garden, lets you listen to free radio stations everywhere. And her radio station is one of them, so I can tune that in in just uh, two minutes in the car and, and I can listen to it for hours. So uh, I do keep in touch. You, you hear the local things that are going on uh, during her show and yeah, it does help. Probably the biggest thing that I really enjoy the most with the, with the band right now is the radio show Grandma does. It's something that as a suitcase farmer, I can still listen to. I'm in Bemidji, I can listen to it or from out into Washington or Houston or wherever, I can listen to her music. And it really puts a smile on my face as I'm listening and put a request in and I usually get a, a song played. So it's, it's pretty special when I think about that and the followers that she has from all over. It, it really is great to listen as she puts that personal touch to her radio show. We've always tried to incorporate young people in the band and tried to include the, the kids and the grandkids. We've had parties in the garage. We've played for the grandkids as wedding dances. Uh, at least a little bit of polka music for them to kind of have a little fun. And now the great grandkids are enjoying it. So that's, that makes me feel good. My husband Virgil passed away November the 12th, 2021. And you know, the legacy that he left, <clears throat> he was a hard worker. You know, the day he passed away, he hunted deer. He had hunted deer that season. He got his deer earlier, but he hunted deer that morning, fed his cattle. He had, we still had some beef cattle and um, enjoyed being outside. He certainly didn't act his age and he was a good example that <clears throat> hard work never hurt anybody. He enjoyed his family. He enjoyed a, a good beer once in a while, a good uh, brandy seven. He enjoyed a good polka dance. He was a good polka dancer. 
and he enjoyed fun when it was fun, but he enjoyed hard work and he could separate the two. So he passed, and of course, when he passed away, he passed on the land and, and what goes, and the hard work ethics that go with it. So we were married 61 years. Just, we were just about married 61 years, it would have been, so we had a good life together. The best office is right behind me. Sitting in the cab all day, sitting in the combine, that is truly the best office. You know, we all kind of have somewhat of an office job outside of, uh, outside of the farm. Well, I guess I farm because I was raised a farmer, but I left the farm for a while when I was in the military and a few years after that. But the farm never leaves you. You drive around the countryside, you see all the people raising something, and then they're taking care of the land, they're harvesting, they're providing food for other people. I get into, uh, when did I really realize I wanted to be a farmer? It's probably at uh, 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning. We used to raise pigs and we had a lot of little pigs. They were 40 pounders and they'd go to market. The pig man, he always came somewhere between 2 and 4 a.m. And I remember the one day he came to pick up all these little pigs. And uh, I was awake, I was ready, because he wasn't gonna take my pig. I went in the pig pen, held onto my pig, and cried and cried until I was able to keep this little pig, which turned out to be a, just a really good sow as it was going, but I, that's when I realized I wanted to be a farmer. We have, we have surpassed the century farm by quite a few years, 133 years that the farm has been in the Erickson name, and we have the hopes that it continues and that you can, we can make it work. Well, I think of that, you know, when the grandparents came across the, from Sweden, you know, you, you think they grabbed their suitcase, their trunk, and they came here permanently. And I would imagine when they first got here, they lived out of their trunk or suitcase for some time until they built a house. You know, as, as I'm living out of a suitcase to now, I'm building a legacy, right? It's a little bit different because I'm not living here. I have a home in Bemidji, but it's that legacy part. It's to keep the family farm together, you know, for the next generation and beyond. In my mind, you know, life lessons on the farm is, is it building to last. You know, if I think our, our farm started in 1889, you know, I'm a fourth generation farmer, have daughters that could be a fifth, and they're already helping on the farm right now. And when they came over from Sweden back in the day, aspiring the hard work that they put in the, in the ground, the blood, sweat, and tears the whole way through, and how that carried on and carried on, it's our job to keep it going. Oh, I hope you guys like that story of the Erickson family farms. I know. I learned a little bit and it's my family, so that's pretty exciting. But if you like the story, don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button. Comment down below maybe what your favorite part is. Maybe you learned what suitcase farming is. Who knows? But anyways, thanks for watching guys. We'll join you next time.